As a caregiver of infants and toddlers, close observation allows you to experience firsthand the developmental growth of language, cognition, and social emotional abilities. We know that the brain is also experiencing a rapid period of growth during these first three years of life, but brain development is not as easy to directly observe. The goal of this section is to provide an overview of some of the major brain structures and processes, and importantly, explain how these structures and processes develop during infancy and toddlerhood. Brain Development – Volume Growth The brain begins developing a few weeks after conception and continues developing throughout the time in the womb. Once a baby is born, the major structures of the brain are formed and ready for the many new experiences of infancy. The explosive growth and function of the brain in infancy is unparalleled by any other postnatal developmental period. After birth, the brain continues to grow at a remarkable pace with its total volume doubled in the first year, followed by another 15% increase during the second year. The brain quadruples in size during the preschool period, reaching approximately 90% of adult volume by age 6. The figure on the screen shows the growth trajectory of brain volume from 0 to 18 years of age. The blue lines represent the growth for males and the red lines represent the growth for females. The yellow segment highlights the significant difference of growth between the two sexes. Notice how steep the trajectory rises in the first three years, representing this explosive brain growth. Let's now zoom in and focus on the month-by-month -month brain growth during just the first two years. The figures on the screen chart the normative growth in brain volume for female and male children, respectively, between 0 to 24 months of age. Just as there are normative growth charts for infant and toddler height, weight, and head circumference, Peterson et al. 2021 have published the first ever normative percentile curves for brain volume growth during childhood, with special attention toward infancy and toddlerhood. Each chart displays the 3rd, 15th, 50th, 85th, and 97th percentiles of normal brain volume growth during the first two years. Percentile curves allow a child to be compared to other children of the same sex and age, determining whether a child measures below or above the average. In these charts, for example, if a child measures at the 50th percentile, this suggests that at any specific age, 50% of the children will have larger brain volumes and 50% will have smaller brain volumes. If a child's brain volume is in the 15th percentile, this means 15% of children have smaller brain volumes and 85% have larger brain volumes than this child. Compare and contrast the figures on the screen. What stands out to you? What do you notice is similar or different between the two charts? Notice the steady increase in brain volume each month, with the largest increases in the earlier months, primarily during the first 12 months. Comparing the two charts, Males have a larger brain volume than females, a difference that appears early in infancy. Also, the percentile curves highlight the fact that there are early appearing individual differences in brain volume between children of the same sex, already by the first few months of life. In other words, as an example, by two months of age, some infants are at, below, or above the 50th percentile. Brain volume during infancy and toddlerhood does not predict cognitive ability during these ages. However, sex and age normalized brain volume for children between 6 and 18 years of age is related to cognitive performance. Structures of the brain The surface of the brain, known as the cerebral cortex, is very uneven, characterized by a distinctive pattern of folds or bumps, known as gyri, singular gyrus, and grooves, known as sulci, singular sulcus, shown in the figure on the screen. These gyri and sulci form important landmarks that allow us to separate the brain into functional centers. The most prominent sulcus, known as the longitudinal fissure, is the deep groove that separates the brain into two halves or hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. 
The two hemispheres are connected by a thick band of neural fibers known as the corpus callosum, consisting of about 200 million axons. The corpus callosum allows the two hemispheres to communicate with each other and allows for information being processed on one side of the brain to be shared with the other side. The two hemispheres of the cerebral cortex are part of the forebrain, which is the largest part of the brain. The forebrain contains the cerebral cortex and a number of other structures that lie beneath the cortex, subcortical structures, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the limbic system. The cerebral cortex, which is the outer surface of the brain, is associated with higher level processes, such as consciousness, thought, emotion, reasoning, language, and memory. Each cerebral hemisphere can be subdivided into four lobes, each associated with different functions. Lobes of the brain. The four lobes of the brain are the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. The frontal lobe is located in the forward part of the brain, located behind your forehead. The frontal lobe is involved in reasoning, motor control, emotion, and language. It contains the motor cortex, which is involved in planning and coordinating movement, the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for higher level cognitive functioning, and Broca's area, which is essential for language production. The brain's parietal lobe is located immediately behind the frontal lobe and is involved in processing information from the body's senses. It contains the somatosensory cortex, which is essential for processing sensory information from across the body, such as touch, temperature, and pain. The temporal lobe is located on the side of the head, temporal means near the temples, and is associated with hearing, memory, emotion, and some aspects of language. The auditory cortex, the main area responsible for processing auditory information, is located within the temporal lobe. Wernicke's area, important for speech comprehension, is also located here. Whereas individuals with damage to Broca's area have difficulty producing language, those with damage to Wernicke's area can produce sensible language, but they are unable to understand it. The occipital lobe is located at the very back of the brain and contains the primary visual cortex, which is responsible for interpreting incoming visual information. Other areas of the forebrain. Other areas of the forebrain located beneath the cerebral cortex include the thalamus and the limbic system. The thalamus is a sensory relay for the brain. All of our senses, with the exception of smell, are routed through the thalamus before being directed to other areas of the brain for processing. The limbic system is involved in processing both emotion and memory. Interestingly, the sense of smell projects directly to the limbic system. Therefore, not surprisingly, smell can evoke emotional responses in ways that other sensory modalities cannot. The limbic system is made up of a number of different structures, but three of the most important are the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. The hippocampus is an essential structure for learning and memory. The amygdala is involved in our experience of emotion and in tying emotional meaning to our memories. The hypothalamus regulates a number of homeostatic processes, including the regulation of body temperature, appetite, and blood pressure. The hypothalamus also serves as an interface between the nervous system and the endocrine system and in the regulation of sexual motivation and behavior. Cerebral lateralization. The second year of life marks a period of dramatic advances in children's expressive and receptive language abilities. How does the developing brain support this explosive language growth? Cerebral lateralization refers to the functional specialization of the two cerebral hemispheres. In other words, each hemisphere becomes dominant in primarily processing specific types of information. A common example of cerebral lateralization is language processing. Most adults predominantly process language in the left hemisphere. However, Lateralization of language to the left hemisphere is not present at birth, but rather develops over the first three years. Across the first three years of life, neuroscience has discovered changes in brain activity, especially shifts in cerebral specialization related to children's language experience. As the figure on the screen shows, between 13 to 17 months of age, 
brain activity is bilateral, activated across both hemispheres. However, just a few months later, by 20 months of age, brain activity is predominantly lateralized to the left hemisphere. This pattern of results has been supported by studies of word processing. In 19 to 22 month old simultaneous bilingual children, in late talkers up to age 30 months, and in 18 to 30 month old children with autism spectrum disorder, and typically developing controls. These data indicate that left lateralization of brain activity is not present at birth, and the timing from bilateral to left lateralization is strongly related to experience with language, specifically word familiarity, rather than chronological age. Neurons, structure and function. The human brain is arguably the most complex of all biological systems. The adult brain is composed of more than 100 billion neurons. Neurons are the information processing cells in the brain. There are many different kinds of neurons that vary in their size and shape as well as in their function. Neurons make connections with other neurons to form the information processing networks that are responsible for all of our thoughts, sensations, feelings, and actions. Since each neuron can make connections with more than 1,000 other neurons, the adult brain is estimated to have more than 60 trillion neuronal connections. Populations of neurons are connected to one another by fibers that extend from cell bodies of the individual neurons. There are two kinds of connecting fibers, dendrites and axons. Dendrites are arrays of short fibers that look like the branches of a tree. They extend only a short distance away from the neuron cell body. Their main function is to receive the electrochemical input signals from other neurons. Axons are long connecting fibers that extend over long distances and make connections with other neurons, often at the dendrites. Axons act a little like telephone wires in that they are responsible for sending electrochemical signals to neurons located in distant locations. Bundles of individual axons from many different neurons within one region of the brain form fiber tracks that extend to and make connections with groups of neurons in other regions of the brain, forming the information processing networks. Axons are wrapped in a fatty substance called myelin that, like insulation on a telephone wire, makes the transmission of electrochemical signals between regions efficient. Myelin is white in appearance, thus fiber pathways of the brain are often referred to as white matter or white matter pathways. Neurons communicate with each other through chemical signaling, a process in which they exchange chemicals called neurotransmitters. This is how it happens. An action potential is an electrical impulse that travels through a neuron, triggering it to release neurotransmitters into a small gap found in between two neurons, called a synapse. Then the dendrites of the neuron on the other side of the synapse takes up the neurotransmitters, which then generates an action potential that travels along the axon of this second neuron. This process continues in several neurons that are connected to each other. While most of the brain's 100 to 200 billion neurons are present at birth, they are not fully mature during infancy and toddlerhood. As they mature, neurons establish connections between each other. Synapses, the connections between neurons, undergo a period of transient exuberance or temporary dramatic growth. This is a proliferation of these synapses during the first two years so that by age two, a single neuron might have thousands of connections. The figure on the screen shows neurons and their connections from an area within the frontal lobe of the cortex. Image A on the left is from the brain of a one-month-old infant, and image B is from the brain of a six-year-old. As we are born with most of the neurons we will ever have, the difference between these two images is not a difference in the quantity of neurons. Rather, the difference between them is in the quantity and quality of connections. After the dramatic increase in synapses, the neural pathways that are not used will be eliminated, thereby making those that are used much stronger. This process of elimination is called pruning. Experience will shape which of these connections are maintained and which of these are pruned. Ultimately, about 40% of the early connections will be lost. 
This activity is occurring primarily in the cortex, or the thin outer covering of the brain involved in voluntary activity and thinking. The prefrontal cortex, located behind our forehead, continues to grow and mature throughout childhood and experiences an additional growth spurt during adolescence. It is the last part of the brain to mature and will eventually comprise 85% of the brain's weight. As the prefrontal cortex matures, the child is increasingly able to regulate or control emotions, to think hypothetically, strategize, and have better judgment. Of course, this is not fully accomplished in infancy and toddlerhood, but continues throughout childhood and into adulthood. Myelination. Another significant change occurring in the central nervous system is the development of myelin, a coating of fatty tissue around the axon of the neuron. Myelin helps insulate the nerve cell and speed the rate of transmission of impulses from one cell to another. This increase enhances the building of neural pathways and improves coordination and control of movement and thought processes. During infancy, myelination progresses rapidly with increasing numbers of axons acquiring myelin. This corresponds with the development of cognitive and motor skills, including language comprehension, speech acquisition, sensory processing, reaching, grasping, and crawling, walking. The development of myelin continues into adolescence, but is most dramatic during the first several years of life. Development of brain networks. How does the brain retain so much information while also having the ability to quickly and efficiently process new information during infancy and toddlerhood? The adult brain is a highly organized network consisting of billions of interconnected neurons. Fast and efficient communication throughout the brain is necessary for nearly all cognitive processes. One theory suggests that the brain has sets of networks. Each network is composed of hubs that represent distinct brain regions with pathways connecting these regions. Franson et al. 2010 were the first to investigate the functional architecture of the infant brain. They reported that functional networks are already present, even if in basic form, in the newborn brain and are predominantly located in the sensory and motor regions of the brain, supporting early infant sensory motor development. The figure on the screen illustrates the developmental changes in brain networks between one-month-olds, one-year-olds, and two-year-olds. Compare the images for each age group. What similarities and differences do you notice? In one-month-olds, the network hubs are located in the anterior, near the front, and posterior, near the back, areas of the brain, with limited connections between anterior and posterior hubs. In comparison, in one-year-olds, the network hubs are located more toward the center of the brain, with more connections linking all the hubs together. Finally, in two-year-olds, the location of the hubs become more spatially distributed, with hubs located across the brain and connections linking all the network hubs together. In summary, this research shows that children are born with brain networks ready to process the many sensory and motor experiences of early infancy. And within the first two years, these networks experience major transformations as they continue to support the rapidly developing child. Growth Patterns of Brain Matter Looking at the tissue of the brain, there are regions that predominantly contain neuron cell bodies and dendrites, and regions that are largely composed of just axons. These two regions are often referred to as gray matter, the regions with many cell bodies and dendrites, or white matter, the regions with many myelinated axons. The figure on the screen demonstrates the appearance of these regions in the brain and spinal cord. The colors ascribed to these regions are what would be seen in quote-unquote fresh or unstained brain tissue. Gray matter is not necessarily gray. It can be pinkish because of blood content, or even slightly tan depending on how long the tissue has been preserved. But white matter is white because axons are insulated by a lipid-rich substance called myelin. Lipids can appear as white, quote-unquote fatty material, much like the fat on a raw piece of chicken or beef. Actually, gray matter may have that color ascribed to it because next to the white matter, it is just darker, hence gray. There is a rapid growth of total brain volume in the first three years, but the rate of growth is different for gray and white matter. The figure on the screen depicts the pattern of average total brain volume growth across the first 547 days, approximately 18 months, of development 
as well as the individual growth trajectories of white and gray matter. The figure on the screen illustrates the relatively faster growing trend of gray matter compared with white matter growth, suggesting that early brain volume growth is dominated primarily by increases in gray matter. The figures on the screen show the growth of gray and white matter for females and males separately across the first three years of life and for each year after that until 18 years of age. These graphs further emphasize the rapid growth of brain volume for both white and gray matter during infancy and toddlerhood. Social Justice Insight Family Income Affects the Rate of Infant and Toddler Brain Growth Hansen et al. 2013 analyzed repeated measures of brain development of children between five months and four years of age from economically diverse backgrounds. The data suggests that low socioeconomic status SES, environments influence the rate of human infant brain development. As the figure on the screen shows, infants and toddlers from lower income families began their lives with similar gray matter brain volumes, but by toddlerhood, they had lower total gray matter compared with those from middle and high income households. As infants aged and presumably had increased exposure to the effects of their environments, the differences in brain volume between children from lower SES homes and those from higher SES homes widened. Furthermore, smaller volumes in this brain tissue were related to greater behavioral problems in the preschool years. Questions to consider. What are the different environmental factors between high versus low SES families that may be mainly driving this data? Are group care facilities that primarily serve high or low SES families different? In which ways? In what ways may infant and toddler care facilities be biased towards serving a particular SES population? What policies and practices can we better implement in an attempt to improve the environments for infants and toddlers in group care? Brain Systems Underlying Development During the first two years of life, the brain undergoes dramatic growth while supporting the development of various behavioral and cognitive abilities. As a caregiver, you cannot directly observe this brain growth, but you are able to witness the many developmental milestones infants and toddlers rapidly progress through. Neuroscience has shown that many developmental achievements are supported by specific underlying brain systems. The type of secure attachment young children develop is related to the relationships they have with caregivers. In six-month-old infants, caregiver sensitivity and brain functional connectivity were related between the hippocampus and brain regions important to emotion regulation, cognitive flexibility, and social communication. Between six to eight months of age, infant brains are able to distinguish between the sounds of any language, but by around one year of age, they neurally commit and become more efficient at processing their native language and less proficient at distinguishing between sounds not found in their native language. At 12 months of age, the achievement of walking is correlated with functional brain connectivity of motor networks in the infant brain. Joint attention, the coordinated focus of two people on an object, emerges over the first two years of life and supports social communicative functioning related to the healthy development of language, empathy, and theory of mind. The functional organization of the brain is related to the emergence of joint attention in infants and toddlers. The accelerated vocabulary development after 18 months that many children experience is related to a rapid myelination phase in language-related temporal and frontal brain regions. As these studies demonstrate, not only is the brain experiencing overall growth in volume and functionality, specific brain systems are supporting children's evolving abilities, many of which we, as caregivers, observe in their behaviors. Conclusion As caregivers, we have the wonderful opportunity to witness the remarkable development that takes place from infancy through toddlerhood. During these First three years, the brain is also experiencing dramatic developmental change. This section presented an overview of some of the basic brain physiology with special attention given to the transformative changes that take place during the first three years of life as the brain continues to support the many discoveries and experiences of infants and toddlers.